It's a real pleasure to be here today to talk with fellow Earth scientists about climate and other people who are vitally interested in the Earth. Our atmosphere came from Earth, and Earth continues to control climates in many ways that are not completely understood at this point. Meanwhile, 7.4 billion people have become populous enough to cause climate change also. And it's extremely important that we understand what is causing the climate change and what we can do about it. Now, Earth has been of prime importance to me since I was born. Not only is it the home where you and I live, but I spent most of my youth out enjoying nature, climbing mountains, camping, and canoeing. It was extremely important to me. I chose Dartmouth College over Harvard University because Dartmouth was much closer to nature. I thought I was going to major in physics, but first semester I stumbled into a geology class. I ended up sitting in the middle of the front row, fascinated. I was just amazed what we could tell from looking at rocks. Within two months, I was working for the professor. He was a well-known volcanologist. And by the age of 19, he took me to climb my first active volcano. I went on my honeymoon uh, and spent the honeymoon studying earthquakes and volcanoes in Alaska. <coughs> I went uh, to Columbia University <laughs> and studied uh, earthquakes and volcanoes in Iceland to get my PhD. Then I spent 27 years with the United States Geological Survey, during which time I personally put instruments on over a dozen active volcanoes around the world. Eventually, after a really, really rewarding career, I decided to retire and have fun canoeing, climbing, camping, uh, skiing. Moved to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and uh, life was, was looking pretty good. 10 years ago, I stumbled on an enigma, the related this relationship between volcanoes and climate. And as I'll explain in a minute, I looked at this enigma and said, wait a minute, there's no way. What's going on here? And the more I studied it, the more I looked at it. I said, whoa, if I could understand this, this could be really important. So 10 years ago, after looking into the details and deciding that it was important, I took everything else in my life and put it aside, almost everything except my wife. And I was able to concentrate full time. And the wonderful thing about being retired is you don't have to commute. You don't have all the responsibilities that keep us so busy during our life that it's hard to actually do science. So now, 10 years later, I've been through shelves of books, well over 10,000 scientific papers, just trying to understand how climate works. And what's really been rewarding is I haven't answered to anybody. I've been self-funded. I've been just following my own curiosity, and as I'll show you in a moment, it's led in some very interesting directions that I think makes a big advance forward. I want to discuss with you today how looking at data on geology and volcanology and how it applies to climate is actually leading to a major revolution in physics. Now, starting in uh, 1988, about three dozen scientists banded together to drill ice cores in Greenland. And this is the Greenland, an ice sheet project drill hole two uh, that I'm, the data I'm showing, but there are many holes. These were at the summit of Greenland looking down. They went down uh, through about three kilometers of ice. And what is interesting about these ice core studies is that in each layer of ice, they can measure many chemical things. One of the most interesting is looking at the oxygen isotopes and the air bubbles in the ice. And that's a proxy for temperature gives us a pretty good idea of what the temperature was when the ice finally became ice. Secondly, you can look at many chemical content, and the one I'm going to talk about today is sulfate. And the majority of the sulfate comes from volcanoes. It comes from some other areas that you can work out chemically and separate it. So we're talking about volcanic sulfate. And that basically is the fingerprint of how much volcanism was going on at that time. And if we look at the basic data, the, the black line is this proxy for temperature. This is now the end of the last ice age, about 25,000 years ago. The red line shows the volcanic sulfate per century, which is the amount of volcanism going on per century. What we notice immediately is that during the times of major warming, there were times of major volcanic activity. And this is the enigma I looked at. I mean, every volcanologist and climatologist knows the volcanic eruptions like Pinatubo in 1991 caused cooling. And I said, wait a minute, how could volcanoes cause both cooling and warming? It turns out that the duration and continuity of volcanism is most important. 
And in this case, you can see it about 10,000 years ago with a major warming coming out of the last ice age. The fact that the volcanism was continuous, pretty continuous, for about 2,000 years meant that it warmed the world enough, warmed the ocean enough to get us out of the last ice age. You see, the ocean is the major heat content in the world, and you have to change the temperature of the ocean to change the pre prevailing temperature on land. Now, at this time, it's, it's very clear in Iceland that there was a great deal of basaltic volcanism. This is the uh, mountain called Herdebreith in uh, northeastern Iceland, and that means broad shoulders. And broad shoulders came about by the fact that the basalts build vertically. And you get these mountains that used to be called Table Mountains, now they're called Tuya, that were built up under the ice. And if you look at the uh, relationship of these throughout Iceland, you see that of the younger ones that are out there, most of them were formed between about 14,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago, which is exactly the time in that previous slide when we had the major volcanism going on. And it's been pointed out by Hubis and, and Langmire in 2007 and others that the volcanism was extremely high during this period of time from about 12,000 to 7,000 years ago. And that one of the results of that would be that it would be melting the ice sheet, which would unload the pressure on the magma chambers, which meant the volcanoes could let out more magma. So there's a feedback loop here as we melt the ice sheet and basaltic volcanism under ice uh, again builds these big mountains melts the ice sheet, provides a lot of fresh water into the North Atlantic, uh, and this is the cycle we've seen going on. Now, the kind of volcanism we're talking about is shown here in the recent eruption of Bardabunga, central Iceland. You didn't hear much about it because it didn't interrupt air traffic. Amazing eruption. It started in August 2014 and ended in February 2015. And in six months, if ooze basaltic lava over an area of 85 square kilometers. Now that's 20% of the area of London. We're talking about a lot of lava here in six months. This was the highest rate of basaltic extrusion since the eruption of Lockheed in 1783. Truly significant event. It's more than 30 times faster than what goes on in Hawaii. And what's interesting is it's basically safe to watch. Just as in Hawaii, uh, unless you're very unlucky, you can get fairly close and be amazed for long periods of time because it doesn't explode. It just kind of oozes this stuff out over the land. You may have fountains as seen here, but it doesn't explode things up into the stratosphere, which is very important. So major extrusive volcanic eruptions extrude basaltic lava over large areas for months to even hundreds of thousands of years. Do not eject much debris into the stratosphere do not form aerosols in the stratosphere, and can warm the world out of ice ages as long as they last for several thousand years, or at least a couple of thousand years. And we will see later that if it only lasts for a century or even less, then we don't stay out of ice ages. So we have the example of Barthabunga, where in six months it was 85 square kilometers. We have the example of Laki in 1783, where in eight months it extruded about 565 square kilometers. And during that time, the temperatures in Europe rose about 3.3 degrees centigrade during the uh, actual eruptions that were going on. Another example is Eldia, the largest of these eruptions in written history that extruded 800 square kilometers. And the history is not real clear, but it's somewhere between three to eight years. So we can see that oh, throughout recent geologic time, there have been several big basaltic effusive eruptions that are very different from explosive eruptions. And in fact, it was the eruption of Eldia that led to the onset of the medieval warm period. And there were many other volcanic eruptions going on about the same time, time that were involved. But again, it's the basaltic eruption was the major factor in forming the medieval warm period. Now, going back 252 million years ago, there was a Siberian basalt known as the Siberian Traps that covered an area of 7 million square kilometers. I mean, this is gigantic. This is larger than all of Europe, covered with basaltic lava. At this time, 96% of marine species went extinct. 70% of terrestrial vertebrates went extinct. Then when Africa and North America moved apart with the opening of the North Atlantic, we have the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. And this was basalts covering an area of 11 million square kilometers. Again, big change. And during both of these times, there was major warming. There was major ocean acidification. Uh, and major change in species. 
A more recent example you've probably heard about is the Deccan basalts in India 66 million years ago. These covered an area of about 500,000 square kilometers. And if we look at the relationship on the left here between mass extinctions, the dates of mass extinctions, and on the x-axis, the ages of continental flood basalts, we see a very close relationship. It's a pretty direct relationship. And we not only see the Siberian basalts up here in the central Atlantic magmatic province and the Deccan traps, but we also see things like the end of Paleocene eruption on the right, you can see the very rapid increase in volcanism during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, the extrusion of basaltic magma 56 million years ago. Notice how sharp that peak is in the plot in the middle, and that during the time sea surface temperatures rose 6 degrees centigrade. Now sea surface temperatures in the last ice age, coming out of the ice age, rose 3.3 degrees centigrade. This is major warming. We're talking six degrees for warming the ocean surface. And this was uh, at a time that was the opening of the North Atlantic, essentially Greenland and Norway moving apart. These are basaltic volcanic eruptions similar to what we see in Hawaii. But with volumes much greater uh, when we're talking about spreading centers that erupt for months to hundreds of thousands of years. Cover areas of tens to millions of square kilometers are contemporaneous with major global warming, cause major ocean acidification through sulfur dioxide forming sulfuric acid, cause extinctions of as much as 83% of all genera within one event, in the case of the, the Siberian basalts, have occurred sporadically throughout Earth history and are not particularly dangerous to watch. You don't want to be in the way of the lava, but you don't have to be miles away. Now I want to talk about the volcanoes that you're more familiar with, the big explosive volcanoes. This picture shows Mount Pinatubo in 1991 before it erupted. Then there was a big explosion, actually several big explosions in June of 1991. And the picture on the lower left shows what was left of Mount Pinatubo. So huge volumes of rock and debris and lava, magma, ash were blown as high as 35 kilometers up into the stratosphere. And the result was an aerosol was formed, whose particles grew big enough over time to reflect and scatter sunlight. So this kind of big explosive volcano leads to cooling, typically about a half a degree cooling for the two or three years. Now Pinatubo was the largest eruption in our lifetime. This same kind of cooling was observed after the Katmai Nova Rupta eruption in 1912 in Alaska. It was observed after Krakatoa in 1883. And it was observed after Tambora in 1815. Now Tambora was the largest volcanic eruption in recent history. An order of magnitude bigger than Krakatoa and Katmai, which are an order of magnitude bigger than Pinatubo. Following the 1815 eruption of Tambora was so immense that the year 1816 is known as the year without summer. This was the largest eruption of this, explosive eruption of this type since 1258 AD. More than 71,000 were probably killed, about half of them related to the blast and the other half related to the worst famine during the 19th century. So there's a huge change in climate, explosive volcanoes causing cooling. So major explosive volcanic eruptions erupt for days, Sometimes they recur every 500 years, but there's just this puff of magma that comes out and it's all over a very short time. It ejects debris more than 35 kilometers up into the stratosphere, forms aerosols in the lower stratosphere at 15 to 25 kilometers that last for two to three years, deplete ozone, causing short-term warming. On the right is the annual average ozone measured in Arosa, Switzerland, which is the oldest station measuring ozone starting in 1927. And just looking at the wiggles there for a moment, you can see that when Pinatubo erupted in 1991, there was the biggest depletion of ozone ever observed during the, the, this record. And what's really interesting is that during the eruption of AF Yadli in 2010, now that's the volcano you're familiar with because it interrupted the European airspace for a couple of weeks. But that was a hundred times smaller than Pinatubo, and yet it depleted ozone about as much as Pinatubo did. So the lowest levels of annual ozone recorded at all the stations that we have out there were following the year 92 and 93, following Mount Pinatubo. And what we saw was that there was warming of about three and a half degrees centigrade in December of 1991 and January of 1992. This is uh, data from Robach, and you can see that in the northern continents, 
particularly Europe, Central North America, out into Asia. There was early warming of about 3.5 degrees centigrade, but then the aerosols grew large enough to take over, so there was net cooling as a result of this explosive volcano. Now, if we do some modeling, we find out that this cooling that happens, it only lasts for a couple of years, three years in the really big volcanoes, has a much more lasting effect. This plot in the middle shows two different models. The one on the bottom is the warming of the ocean that's going on since 1880 uh, as a, without allowing for Krakatoa. The plot on top shows putting in the effect of Krakatoa. And what you can see is that 100 years later, we're still seeing that thermal effect. So these explosive volcanoes cool the Earth that we can see for about three years, two to three years. But the thermal effect of having cooled the surface of the ocean that covers 71% of the Earth just for those few three years, we can still see, according to modeling at least, 100 years later. Another way of looking at this cooling is by modeling the sea surface change as a result of reducing temperature in the ocean. And this is work by Gregory et al. in 2006. But notice how following Krakatoa, he shows there was a cooling of the ocean, a shrinking of the ocean. It began to recover, but then the volcano Agum, and we get a cooling again, then the volcano El Chichon in 1982, and then Pinatubo. So if you start having these explosive volcanoes at the rate of five to 10 per century, you can increment the world down into an ice age. So when you have a high frequency of explosive volcanoes, you can cool the world into an ice age. When you have a long duration of basaltic effusive volcanoes, you can warm the world out of an ice age. Now I wanna look at a longer period of time. This is going back 120 million years. And what I've shown here in the green line is this temperature proxy from oxygen isotope data. What I've shown in the black line is the estimate of ocean crust production and increasing to the left. What I've shown in the red line is the cumulative number of major vo erupted volcanoes. A paper I put out in 2009 has an extensive table of all the largest volcanic eruptions that we're aware of going back for a very long time. And that's what this data is from. The blue line here is the onset of the major ice in Antarctica 34 million years ago. And what we notice is that as ocean production, as ocean spreading increased and volcanism on land increased, that's when we went into the major ice ages that started about 34 million years ago and have peaked in the last few million years as the volcanism has increased and as seafloor production has increased. So what we have here is a balance going on between global warming called, caused by the duration of effusive volcanism, basaltic effusive volcanism, and cooling going on by the frequency of explosive volcanism. And when we look at the ice core record, what we see is remarkable that in the last 120,000 years, there were at least 25 times when the world suddenly warmed out of the ice age. And looking at the actual ice core data, I can tell you in many cases that was within a few years, and in most cases less than a decade. We popped out of the ice age. But then it took centuries to millennia to cool back into the ice age. For one thing, we hadn't warmed the ocean enough, so it was cooling us back into the ice age. For another thing, there could be more explosive eruptions, which would have cooled us back into the ice age. But 25 times within, so every four to 5,000 years, we popped out of the Ice Age and then slid back slowly into the Ice Age. This is data, uh, any of the boreholes in Greenland and elsewhere around the world, uh, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, you see this very active climate change going on. Now imagine yourself a caveman, and within a few years, you came out of the Ice Age. What's interesting is that there was a bottleneck in human history back around 70,000 years ago, when there may have only been 10,000 homo sapiens on the planet. We're not clear what caused that bottleneck, but I would point out here that that was right about the time of the lowest part of the last ice age, and a time when we were in the ice age for quite a bit of time. It was also the time when Mount Toba erupted, which is the largest explosive volcanic eruption in millions and millions of years. Major big eruption. So there was some cooling right after the, the Toba eruption, but we also, that led us into the deepest part of the last ice age that we can see from the record here. It's also interesting that the Paleolithic Revolution really began when we popped out of this deep part of the ice age. 
and we were in and out of the Ice Age a lot during the Paleolithic Revolution. So our ancestors had to be pretty crafty people. They had to survive this kind of radical climate change going on. And it's really amazing to think of what they had to deal with. And of course, when we popped out of the Ice Age and went into the Ice Age, climate changed enough, they had to go look for food. So a lot of the wandering of people uh, was following this rapid change in climate. And again, some of it happening within years to a decade or two. So that was a good reason for people to go out and try to get in an environment that they could still get the food they were used to getting. So the fundamental footprint of climate change is erratic, sudden, major global warming within a few years, followed by cumulative cooling over centuries to millennia, where an average cycle lasts only a few thousand years. Any explanation for global warming that's going to apply to geologic time has to explain these sudden changes and they're well documented. This same kind of cycling is observed in human history. And this is a simplified diagram, just to simply, you've heard of the Little Ice Age, you've heard of the Medieval Warm Period. Anyway, major parts of our history going back in time show the same kind of cycling from warm to cold, from warm to cold. And oh, I didn't put the data on here. You can see um, basaltic eruptions like in the Medieval Warm Period here. Uh, at 935 AD was basaltic eruptions led to that warming. Uh, and, and we can, throughout this time, we have a pretty good record of major eruptions. And there's a very close correspondence between not only this kind of cycling, but also the big events in human history. Why some civilizations failed and when they failed, typically running out of water and suddenly getting a lot hotter. So on. I mean, there's a very interesting story here, and I could give several lectures on that. We also see this kind of cycling in the geologic record. Now we're looking uh, back at the Eocene Green River formation in southwestern Wyoming. This is work done by Rod Sertum, who was state geologist of Wyoming uh, for a number of years. And what he found was that these very fine layers you see in the rocks consisted of oil shale, trona, and dolostone. And the oil shale, he argues, was formed in an environment like we see at Mud Lake, Florida today. This would be an environment where you would expect oil shales to form. The trona, on the other hand, we see forming today in Lake Magadi in Kenya. So what this is saying, what he's seeing here, is that in southwestern Wyoming, the climate was changing from current day climate to very hot climate like we see in the African Rift Zone uh, today. And it was going back and forth and cycles again that he estimates are like 5,000 years. So these finely layered rocks are clear evidence that these kind of cycles used to happen in the past. Now this is a graph I assume you all understand immediately when you look at it. <laughs> and the point I want to get at here is we want to look at this kind of cycling going on from 500 million years ago to 200 million years ago. Now we don't have the time resolution here that we had in the other studies. But the point I want to get across on this slide these, uh, this is temperature data based on this oxygen isotope measuring it in the uh, Ordovician to Triassic brachiopods. Okay, so in the seashells, you measure the oxygen isotope, get the temperature of the water at the time they were formed. And this work done by Peter Giles at the Geological Survey of Canada shows huge changes going on all the time. And well within, I mean, again, the time resolution here is not as good, but there's big changes going on all the time. And you can see with the light blue down here that there was a trend into an ice age, the Ordovician ice age. And there are changes going back and forth. I'll also note at the top of this column, and this is the Siberian basalts, which are the boundary between the Paleozoic era and the Mesozoic era. So these kind of changes have been going on throughout geologic history as best as we can resolve them. Now I want to talk a little bit about cycles. In climate change, from skeptics and from scientists, you get all kinds of talk about cycles. And they're all trying to explain cycles of different things. And I want to show you something interesting about cycles. This green line is this oxygen isotope data measured with little critters in seafloor sediments. And it's the from 57 of the best sites out there. So we're getting a, an average temperature measured at a lot of sites around the world throughout the last 150,000 years. And you can see at the Emi and the interglacial here, we were warmer, and then we cooled down, and we seemed to go up and down and up and down, and we reached the bottom of the ice age here about 20, 15 to 20,000 years ago. This looks like pretty good data, and it's based on a lot of data. It's averaged together very nicely. Now, if we add to that the insulation due to Milankovitch cycles, this is where there's a change in the amount of sun reaching the Earth 
because of the change in orbit of the distance from the sun, the position of the sun, and so on. We can see there's sort of some similarity here. I mean, it's really bad back here, but here, this is pretty similar. And if we did some fancy statistics, we could come up with a correlation coefficient. And, you know, we might or might not be impressed. Now I have the ice core data. This is the real data at the top of the graph in purple. This is ice cores from Greenland. And notice that there's not much correlation at all with these other two cyclical things. It's happening much more quickly. The, the uh, average of the data suggests that the end of the ice age was about uh, 15 to 20,000 years ago. That's the lowest point in the ice age back there about 70,000 years ago. And that sometime in one of those low points was when people went to Australia. That's when sea level would have been the lowest. And uh, while the people in Australia we're seeing now are 40,000 years old or whatever, 45,000 years, uh, it's during these lows in the Ice Age that would have been their best chance to get there. So what I really want to emphasize is that the real data, the data where you've got time resolution, one of the nice things about the oxygen isotope data is you're measuring a sample. And so you have, if, as well as you can date that sample, you've got pretty good time resolution and that kind of measuring of things. But what we see here, comparing the, what we see in the boreholes uh, in Greenland, the purple data, that there's a huge change going on, up and down, up and down, up and down. So global warming throughout geologic time has been happening suddenly and irregularly. So my argument is volcanoes rule climate. The balance between sudden explosive volcanic eruptions and long periods of effusive volcanic eruptions driven by tectonic plate motions provides the only clear explanation for why climate changes suddenly and irregularly throughout Earth history, from small to gargantuan amounts, gargantuan being the uh, Siberian basalts and the small amounts being those little wiggles we're looking at. But those changes happened, and it's hard to think of any other mechanism that can explain this sudden warming and this slow cooling. Now again, I want to go back in the geologic record over the last 600 million years. And here I've plotted in green the oxygen isotope proxy for temperature again. And you can see it's fairly jagged. Again, what's great about this oxygen isotope is you're measuring on an A critter. And so you can get data points as, as finely as you can space critters. And we can see that there are times that were warm, that are up, and times of, that were colder. And they were basically looking at geologic history. There were four epochs of glaciation. And these have been discussed looking at the rocks and the, the sediments that are left behind by Cowell and, and Frakes, Crowell and Frakes and, and many others, that there are four basic epochs that we can recognize. And what you notice is that uh, we can see that here in the oxygen isotope data. Now the blue curve is sea level, and it was initially called the Vale curve or the Exxon curve. And this is based on looking at sediments around the world and putting together the, story, the offshore story. And you can see that, sure, there was uh, times when the sea level was highest, when there was the most warming. And sea level tends to be lowest when there's glaciation. It takes time to get there. It takes time to heat and cool the ocean. In this case, the data is kind of smoothed out. I'm sure it was much more jagged. Uh, but we just, the resolution we have is it, it's, again, smoothed out. And we go back to what I was saying about cycles. You have to be a little careful realizing now that things happen so quickly. But anyway, there's a pretty good correlation there. Now, if we add carbon dioxide, those first two curves are based on data, reams and reams of data. The carbon dioxide curve here is based on modeling by Robert Berner uh, from Yale in something he calls the geocarb self model. And what he's looking at is how rocks on land weather and how the sediments get formed and what you expect the CO2 content in the atmosphere to be. It's very thoughtful work. He did it. He's got numerous papers on it. It is modeling. We have to be a little bit careful. But what we see is that back at this period of time, before about 500 million years, 540 million years ago, CO2 was 18 times the level of CO2 at the beginning of the Industrial Age. 18 times. This was a time of major warming. But there was some major cooling in here, too. Oh, I didn't point out that the one calibration he has for this data is if you look at the density of stomata, of pores on leaves, fossil leaves, there's something you can see. You can get an estimate by that density of, of stomata as to the CO2 concentration at the time that leaf was seen. So there are several data points on Berner's curve that help calibrate what CO2 was. 
but again, I, this is primarily modeling. One has to be careful, but uh, it certainly suggests that there's not much relationship between CO2 and geologic time where the change is going on in climate. Now, I can give a two-hour lecture with all the different examples in geologic time. In my book, I go through that in some detail, but even then, there's just lo lots of data throughout geologic time that you really have to start waving your arms a lot to explain with CO2. So the question is, are we Earth scientists absolutely sure that the hand of carbon dioxide fits the glove of reality? Now, I'm not talking about O.J. Simpson here. This is the question of whether CO2 fits the, fits the glove of reality. It's never actually been shown experimentally that increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases actually cause the air to warm. It's amazing. We've gotten to the point we are today of getting ready to spend $10 trillion to reduce carb carbon dioxide when it's never been shown experimentally that that actually causes air to warm. There was an experiment done in 1900 by Knud Angstrom, a fairly famous spectral physicist, and he did an experiment in the Canary Islands. He did an experiment in the laboratory, and he said, I don't see much change when you increase CO2. And his work has never been duplicated. Nobody's ever done that experiment. And about six months ago, I issued a challenge. I'm offering $10,000 from my children's inheritance <laughs> to the first person that can demonstrate through an experiment that increased greenhouse gases actually causes the air to warm. Climate models have not predicted temperature correctly since 1998. There's a lot of arm waving going on trying to explain that. But that fact is life. The temperatures were pretty constant there throughout the global warming hiatus. Uh, now they've gotten warm again, and climate models do not predict the sudden warming that we're seeing now. So all the nations on Earth are about to spend up to $10 trillion to reduce greenhouse gases. The meeting in Paris in December was impressive. Uh, it, was, it came about through extreme effort from uh, President Obama and a lot of other world leaders. Uh, there's an impressive consensus. The purpose of setting up the IPCC to begin with was to show that there was a consensus among scientists so that politicians would take the difficult action to reduce global warming. Now that politicians have made the big first step toward that difficult action, but what if these expenditures have no effect on global warming? This would be the greatest economic and political crisis ever created by mistaken science. It's extremely important that we get this right. Scientists have worked very hard for many years, thousands of scientists, to convince each other and the politicians that greenhouse gases are clearly the cause of global warming. And I've studied that history in great detail, and it's very interesting. I mean, these are all very sincere, honest people working very hard, and they're convinced, based on as they understand it at the moment, that it must be causing it. We've got to be sure. $10 trillion, that's $1,000 out of it, the pocket of every man, woman, and child on Earth. Consensus is the stuff of politics. It's necessary to get the choices like this made. But debate is the stuff of science. My main conclusion is that we need to bring genuine scientific debate back to climate change. Now, there's been a lot of debate going on between skeptics and climate scientists for the last couple of decades. I don't call that genuine scientific debate. They both are talking from their own soapbox, and they both are absolutely convinced that they're right. Uh, we need to get constructive discussion going. Science is not done by consensus or by popular vote. Michael Crichton said in a lecture at Caltech in 2003, in science, consensus is irrelevant. What is relevant is reproducible results. The greatest scientists in history are great precisely because they broke with the consensus. Albert Einstein said when he was told about a new book, 100 Scientists Against Einstein, he said, why 100? If I was wrong, one would have been enough. Max Planck, the father of modern physics, wrote in 1936, new scientific ideas never spring from a communal body, however organized, but rather from the head of an individually inspired researcher who struggles with his problems in lonely thought and unites all his thought on one single point, which is his whole world for the moment. OK, so there are some fundamental problems with the physics of greenhouse warming. Are climatologists going to step up to the reality or bury their heads in the sands of consensus? This is a difficult problem. It's not easy, if you've been working all your life, convince the greenhouse gases of what's doing it. To begin to look at other things. Earth science is leading the way. I hope what I've showed you today is there's a very clear record, a balance driven by plate tectonics between frequent explosive volcanic eruptions that cause cooling 
and persistent effusive basaltic eruptions that cause warming. And we see this rapid cycling going on throughout the geologic record. And I would argue that Bartholbunga is one of these effusive eruptions that is, explains why this is such a high year. Now, I want to end with a geologic time scale. I assume most people here are familiar with the geologic time scale. It was created primarily in Great Britain and England and Scotland and came from the early work of James Hutton in 1785 or whatever. Uh, it was John Phillips in 1841 who came up with the first international time scale. Many of the place names here, or any of the names here, reflect places near here. Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, they're all names from England. This was created here in England. And what I showed you, what's amazing to me when I look at the geologic time scale, and you can see it best in the, in the Grand Canyon of the United States, but you can see it anywhere you study geology. You have these long periods of sedimentation that form big, thick sediments, like the Red Wall Formation here. It's shallow marine, the environment was shallow marine for tens of millions of years. Then you have a layer on top of it that changed just like that in geologic time. There had to be a fundamental rapid change in climate right at that time because now the sediments have changed. Now in a few places we see an unconformity where it's been eroded and so on, but still, all of these layers that we study in geology, are you can put your finger on the contact in most cases. You see major changes in animal life before and after, and you see major changes in the environment that they went in. So if we go back and look at the time scale, I showed you the Siberian basalts. We're right at the boundary between the Mesozoic and Paleozoic. The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province was right at the boundary between Triassic and Jurassic. The Deccan basalts in India was right at the boundary between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic. The Paleozoic Eocene Thermal Maximum was right at the boundary between the Paleocene and the Eocene. The Arctic ice that came in 34 million years ago was right at the boundary between the Eocene and the Oligocene. So volcanoes not only rule climate, volcanoes punctuate the geologic time scale. Thank you.